Facebook shares data with device makers, Steam's remote code execution vulnerability is finally fixed, and you should probably reset your vulnerable router. All that coming up now on ThreatWire. Greetings, I am Shannon Morse, and this is ThreatWire for June 5th, 2018, your summary of the threats to our security, privacy, and internet freedom. Our Patreon is over at patreon.com slash threatwire, and that is always the best way to support the show and will help us reach our next goal. So if you want access to exclusives, including the brand new Discord server, check out the Patreon link in the show notes below. And special thanks to our newest patrons, Eric, Bella, Bert, and Christopher. Thank you so much. And now on to the news. The first story, being all about Facebook. Thanks to Joel on Patreon for sending me this story in an ever-growing story shedding light on Facebook about how they handle user data and share it with third parties. News broke yesterday that the company has been sharing data with device makers too, including large names such as Apple, Microsoft, Samsung, and Amazon. Hmm. Oops! At least 60 device makers are included in a partnership program with Facebook, and the program allows device manufacturers access to things like messaging, the like button, and address books, according to the New York Times. Data includes things like relationship status, religions, political stances, and events that a user is currently planning to attend. The data from users was shared with these companies without user consent, and sometimes through friends. It's eerily similar to how data was access via the Cambridge Analytica scandal, go figure. But you might ask, Facebook stopped that data sharing in 2014, didn't they? Well, they did with app makers, but not hardware makers. So even though they signed that 2011 FTC consent decree, the companies still got access to data. Yeah, according to Facebook Vice President Ime Arjabong, the data provides versions of, quote, the Facebook experience to users on those devices, compared to app makers, which provide games and services that do not necessarily contribute to said experience. In the case of device manufacturers, most of the data was used for things like receiving notifications, cross-app sharing, and adding contacts. Microsoft, for example, explained that the data was stored locally, not sent to Microsoft servers. But the partnerships have been slowly decreasing since April as Facebook has been in the spotlight over privacy concerns. So far, 22 partnerships have been shut down entirely, but many still exist, with the Times giving an example of BlackBerry's partnership, which collects more than 50 different data points about a user or their friends when a user connects their Facebook app with their device. Newer devices running Android and iOS don't even need the API access that Facebook has given, so it's made winding down partnerships much easier for the company. With that said though, the secrecy of these partnerships is still pretty concerning, but is it surprising? I would argue no, but I would love to hear your comments as well below. Remote code execution. It's the ability to trigger code to execute from one machine to another. It's commonly referred to as an RCE and is popularly used for exploits and zero days. One such bug was found in the gaming software called Steam, which was built by Valve and has been in their code for at least, get this, 10 years. The RCE bug affected all versions of Steam on all operating systems and was first discovered by Tom Court of Context Information Security, who released information about the bug on Thursday. The RCE occurs because of a heap corruption flaw in the Steam client library, part of the code, and its handling of UDP packets. So heap corruptions are issues within memory that usually end up with a memory leak, which is pretty simple, or in very rare cases, it can also be fatal and cause memory faults. They also just happen to account for 10% of modern application crashes in Windows. Huh, interesting. Now in this case, the flaw could be accessed remotely with a malformed UDP packet, and malicious code could be executed on that machine. Since the code was so old, it appears that it was just never ever checked against newer builds to ensure that it still worked as intended. They basically just left it in there, said, hey, it works like it should, but it's doing bad things with the newest code. Now last year in July, Valve introduced ASP.
DSLR protection or address space layout randomization to the Steam client, which prevents memory corruption vulnerabilities. This accidentally fixed half of the issue without knowing it, but after that date, using the RCE would have just resulted in the client crashing. Court believes it to be a simple oversight and reported it to Valve on February 20th, which was fixed in a beta release 12 hours later and then patched, therefore, on March 22nd. Luckily, Steam auto updates upon reboot, and with over 15 million users, it could have been terrible for business if used in the wild. If you have not updated Steam since early March, now would probably be the time to do it. Props to David who sent this story in that hit my radar a little over a week ago, but since Memorial Day was last week, I wasn't able to report on it, so I'm reporting now. Still, this vulnerability is rather important for router owners, so I figured I should include it. On May 25th, the FBI released an alert titled Foreign Cyber Actors Target Home and Office Routers and Networked Devices Worldwide. In it, the FBI recommended that anyone who owns a consumer or small office router to reboot their devices. Due to concern over a foreign actor compromising hundreds of thousands of these devices worldwide. Over 500,000 to be precise. The malware, called VPN Filter, targets routers made by Linksys, Mikrotik, Netgear, and TP-Link in NAS devices made by QNAP. All of these devices either have default credentials or remote administration turned on, allowing them to be targeted in attacks. A bad actor could collect information about the device and users, exploit the device to further gain access to the network and block network traffic to and from the connection. Using VPN filter, a criminal could render the devices bricked or inoperable, and the malware is encrypted and mistakenly attributed to other network traffic that is legit. Due to this, it's very, very hard to detect or analyze. The malware works in several different stages. So in the first stage, it infects the device and simply looks to connect to a stage two server. If it is successful, stage two will collect information on the user's network, and the attacker could send the kill switch to the machine, which could brick it. Stage three includes a packet sniffer, as well as a communication module to send data over a proxy service, which just so happens to be Tor. The FBI did not release information in the early alert about who was behind the attack, but it was later publicized that Russian state-sponsored actors known as Sophocy, aka Fancy Bear from previous stories, were the culprits. The FBI sees the toknowall.com domain owned by the attackers, thereby they sink, hold the malware, and they cut it off. Cisco also released a report about the malware and their research into VPN filter. They found that the malware was steadily increasing in size based on how many devices were infected, though in the past several weeks, that number has grown tremendously to the amount of over 500,000 devices. Users can reboot their router to disrupt the malware attack and are also advised to disable remote management settings on the devices if you can access it, as well as change the default credential information and add encryption if available. To further that security, users can also update the firmware on their routers to ensure a safer network connection for all devices. Now, while a reboot will not remove the malware since the first stage is persistent, unfortunately, it does cut its current connection short and it stops stages two and three from running for a time. Doing a full factory reset can also help. Now, Cisco and the FBI as well are both taking this vulnerability extremely seriously since it is a state-sponsored attacker. And if you own any of the devices listed at the links below, or you have a friend or a family member who owns one, ensure that they have taken those precautionary steps to help mitigate the issue. Otherwise, stick that router in a dumpster fire and get a new one. I'm just kidding, I'm all about those environmentally friendly recycling options, but still some of those devices out there could probably use an upgrade, so I think it's about time. Shout out to my patrons. Make sure to share your favorite stories in the community tab or on Discord if you're in there. Every Friday, I will pick three or more top stories for a voting poll that patrons can vote on to be included in next week's episode. Patrons get access to a downloadable audio version of the show as well, first looks at show topics, polls, and discussions just for y'all, behind the scene photos, and now that Discord server. And that Discord server is just for patrons at $2 per month and up. So join now to get access to all 
all of these and to help support the show. And our next milestone goal is super exciting. That will get you access to a live video Q&A just for patrons at all levels. And it gets us closer to doing a second episode each week. And honestly, there are a lot of security news stories right now, and I would love to do a second episode for you each week. A big thanks to our Hush Puppy Perk level patrons for sending in their fur baby photos. I love them, so keep them coming. I love these two new ones. They're adorbs. Hit the subscribe button or share this episode on your favorite social media page. And with that, I'm Shannon Morse, and I will see you on the internet. Thank <laughs> you.